following is brought to you by Severn Christian Church, a family church where your life matters. Good morning. Happy Father's Day to all the fathers out there. I want to say it once, I don't have to say it the rest of the day to all 900 of you. So happy Father's Day to all the uh, dads and stepdads. Um, you know, Mr. Greg's been a, a good uh, fake dad, he always likes to say, but he's a, he's a fantastic stepdad for me. So since it's Father's Day, I figured I would share with you guys some dad jokes. Uh, dad jokes are essentially really lame puns, and I love dad jokes uh, because my sense of humor is not all that great as it is. I am, I'm basically ready to be a dad in the sense of just so I can tell awful jokes to my kids. Having kids terrifies me, but I want to be a dad just so I can tell jokes to them. So I want to share a, a few of these, these dad jokes with you. Um, and they really are best when they're off the cusp. Um, you know, when you're the stepdad or the dad says something and you just kind of look at them and that's not even funny, but I still want to laugh. So I, I do want to share one or two, though. Driving home and it was dark. There were three people walking along the shoulder of our street and they were all wearing dark clothes. I almost hit one of them and I say, shaking my head, look at these idiots wearing dark clothes at night. Someone's going to get run over. And dad replied from the passenger seat, yeah, they're not too bright. Do you guys know what the fastest liquid on earth is? Milk. It's pasteurized before you see it. You guys heard of Orion's belt? It's a huge waste of space. Uh, two weeks or so ago, my mom spilled some soap, and this actually is legit. Um, and she got, this is a real one. Uh, she got a little frustrated. It wasn't really bad, but she was kind of just, ah, man, this dang soap. And Mr. Greg's like, don't worry, it's soap. It'll clean itself up. <laughs> It's so bad, but it's so funny. And we all know the classic dad joke. You know, you say to your parents, oh, dad, I'm so hungry. What did the dad say? Hi, hungry, I'm dad. Okay, I'm literally starving over here. Don't patronize me. My favorite joke is uh, I walk up to someone, and I'll like, I'll, like, rub their shirt. I'm like, oh, man, this is my shirt. Is it felt? I'm like, no, I don't think so. Now it is. <laughs> Good one. I still laugh from Mr. Greg as well. Today we're going to be talking about hope. What does it mean to have hope, and what hope do we as Christians have? And so to look at hope, we kind of need to take a step back and look at what happens when you die. It's kind of weird. More specifically, though, we're going to look at what happens when Jesus comes back. So as we move on, I want to ask you, I want you to ask yourself two questions that I hope to answer today. First, do I, do you have hope? Do you have a tangible, solid belief about the future hope about life after death, and what is it if you do? That kind of takes us, kind of leads me to the second question. What is life, what is it going to be like when we die, more, more so when Jesus comes back? Romans 6.23 says, the free gift of God is eternal life. So what is eternal life going to be like? Now before we can look at this future hope of Christianity, there's a few things we need to do. We need to first understand that there exists a lack of hope, I think. I think there's an ignorance of the hope of Christianity in our culture today. Second, we need to understand why this lack of hope exists, where it comes from, where the confusion arises. And then third, because it's extremely important and relevant to our time today, uh, we're going to look back at what Matt talked about last week. So we're going to kind of go over here, go over there, come back over here, and we're going to try to wrap it all up, I hope, into a nice present about hope. So first, I believe there exists a lack of hope in the world today. I think it's fairly obvious that in the world, you know, outside the church, we could say there's a lack of hope. But also, I think, at least in, in the Christian world as, world as well, there seems to be some confusion about hope. It seems like we really have no idea what is going to happen uh, to us after death except that we go to heaven. You know, people say, well, what happens when you die? Oh, well, you, you go up to heaven. Well, what else? You Go to heaven. Or there's this confused doctrine of the rapture that people are going to be lifted up and earth's going to be destroyed and Jesus is going to reign for a thousand years and a bunch of other crazy convoluted things. There's some confusion, I think. And we need to understand the hope that Jesus provided, specifically the hope that we have about life after death. We need to understand that it's bigger and better than going to heaven. Why? Why do we need to understand that? Well, what you think about death and life beyond it is the key to thinking seriously about everything else. Another way to put it is, our belief about what happens after we die will affect and shape our lives and actions on earth. Let me repeat that. 
What we believe about life after death will affect our lives or our actions on earth. For example, if I believe in reincarnation, right? If I believe that if I'm a good person, this is a, a very dumbed down version of this, but if I believe in reincarnation, that I'm, I do good things, that I'll be reincarnated into a better social status or a better body, I'm going to do good things. And if I believe that if I do bad things, I'm going to be reincarnated into a worse body um, or um, a lower social, so social status, then I'm not going to do bad things, right? It's going to affect my belief about what happens when I die is going to affect how I act on the earth. I don't believe in reincarnation. It's just an example for you. Hope. What is hope? I said I uh, believe there's a lack of hope. So what is hope? Well, we hope for a lot of things, right? We hope to win the lottery. We hope our favorite sports team wins. You hope I don't talk forever today. We say things like, I hope you feel better. I hope you had a good time at uh, my birthday party. I don't know, whatever. Uh, and usually it's, it's a positive thing, right? For example, I hope you feel better. But sometimes it can be a negative thing, right? You hope somebody trips on a, on a tree branch or something and bumps their head. There, I think there's a country song about that. I don't listen to country. I wouldn't know. And I could, honestly, I took like five seconds and Googled it last night. But is there a country song that talks about like somebody's hoping, like they walk out of a house and a pot falls on somebody's head or something like that? It's like a, a breakup song. Reed's shaking his head. He's what I'm talking about. I don't listen to country music. I have no idea. But hope is usually a positive thing. But sometimes it can be an, a negative thing, or at least it can relate to things that are negative. For example, uh, we hope we don't lose our job. We hope we have enough money to pay the bills. We hope we can feed the kids. And kind of last but not least, we hope we don't die. At least not until I have a, a full life, right? I do all the good things or the fun things that I want to do. Google says that hope is a feeling of, of expectation and desire for a certain thing to happen. It's a desire with an expectation of obtainment. Hope is a longing and expectation of a positive future outcome. And I think as Christians, for most of us, we do have this positive future hope. But that when it pertains to eternal life, we aren't sure exactly how to articulate what that hope is. We have hope that there will be an eternal life, as Mr. Joe said, with God or Jesus. But we aren't sure what that really looks like. And I think I want to kind of back that up. I think there's a few reasons why I believe that. Uh, first, what I was taught and what I see being taught, right? What I was taught in the church, um, and not just here, but in other you know, camps and all that, uh, growing up. The majority of what I was taught about life after death pertained more to hell and how not to go there than it did to heaven and how to go there. The fact that I was taught more about the negative aspect of eternal life than the positive tells me that maybe the people teaching me didn't know about it either. I want you really to consider the deep implications of that for a second. What kind of backwards teachings are we giving our kids where the prime motivator to be a Christian isn't so that they can partake in hope, joy, and happiness of eternal life, but it's that you need to be a Christian so you don't go to hell? I'm not saying that everybody teaches that or everybody believes that. It's just a, a, what I was taught. But something has, been seriously, has seriously gone wrong when the prime motivator to be a Christian is fear and not hope. It is completely opposite of what the New Testament teaches. I think that the reason we have so much to say about eternal hell is because we have so little, we understand so little about eternal life. The second example, right, to show that we may misunderstand hope is how we word things. This is maybe semantics, maybe not. But people say things like, I hope when Jesus comes back, I get taken up to heaven or that I get to go to heaven, as if heaven uh, was the place that Jesus is going to take us when he comes back. At funerals, we hear nothing about the resurrection, but always how the dead are taken up to God's kingdom. Uh, in our songs, in our hymns, the song, How Great Thou Art, it says, When Christ shall come with shout of acclamation and take me home, what joy shall fill my heart. Take me home as if this place wasn't our home. There are many more other hymns that talk about this. But simply put, there's an overwhelming deficit of resurrection talk, but a plethora of going to heaven talk. These are your five cent words for the day. The third kind of example that shows you may mis misunderstand hope is that Christmas has beaten out Easter as a celebratory center of the Christian year. That is, Christmas is the, the big holiday of Christianity instead of Easter, which is what the New Testament teaches and what the early church practiced. So I think these reasons show us that there is confusion, or maybe at least ignorance, which is okay, acceptable in some instances, about what happens after death. And this confusion, I believe, exists because of two major beliefs or philosophies. And these two false beliefs, these false philosophies, are the idea of progress 
and what is um, called Platonism after the ancient great philosopher Plato. And I only have time to briefly go into these. If you want to know more, I recommend you pick up uh, this book here it's called Surprised by Hope. Uh, I'm, I'm pulling information from it, and he goes into it, uh, the writer, very well about all of these topics, uh, about everything I'm going to be talking about today in way more depth. So if you want to know more, just as a kind of aside, I recommend you pick up this book because I'm not giving you mine. All right? The first of these ideas, though, the idea of progress, or more, pro more appropriately, the illusion of progress, right? What does that say? What does that teach? Well, I'm going to read it because, like I said, he words it a little bit better than I can. The illusion of progress is this. Humans can be made perfect and are indeed evolving toward that point. The world is ours to discover, exploit, and enjoy. And instead of depending on God's grace, we will become, we will become what we have the potential to be by education and hard work. Instead of creation and new creation, science and technology will turn the raw material of this world into the stuff of utopia. Liberal modernism supposes that the world can become everything we want it to be by working a little bit harder, harder and helping forward us into this great march into the glorious future. And I don't like preaching politics from the stage, but I, I think N.T. Wright goes into, um, he has something poignant to say about, about this uh, idea of the illusion of progress as it relates to um, politicians. He talks about politicians. He says, they are to that extent people who are trying to row a boat toward the shore while the strong tide pulls them further and further out to sea. Because they're facing the wrong way, they can't see that their efforts are in vain, and they call out to other people to join them. That is why the relentlessly modernist and progressivist projects that the politicians feel obliged to offer us so they're saying things like, vote for us and, and the change, will, good change will happen. If you vote for me, things will get better. They have to dress it up with rhetoric and hype because in the absence of real hope, all that is left is feelings. Persuasion will not work. We're never going to believe it. What we appear to need and therefore people give us is entertainment. And like what he says here, our politicians demand to be treated like rock stars while our rock stars are pretending to be politicians. So what does this mean? I kind of read that. What does it mean? Let me summarize it for you. The idea of progress essentially says this. Everything will get better if we work harder and if more people are more educated. And now don't misunderstand me. Working harder, working hard and becoming more educated are, is good. I guess maybe I need more education. They are good things, right? But there is a problem with this idea of progress, this illusion of progress. And again, let me read what um, N.T. Wright has here. He says, the real problem with the myth of progress is that it cannot deal with evil. And when I say deal with, I don't just mean intellectually, although that is true. I mean in practice. The illusion of progress cannot develop a strategy that actually addresses the severe problems of evil in the world. This is why all the evolutionary optimism of the last 200 years remains helpless before world war, drug crime, Auschwitz, apartheid, child pornography, and other sidelines that evolution has thrown up for our entertainment. The idea of progress can't explain them, and neither can it eradicate them. And then he says this, The world is in fact still a sad and wicked place, not a happy upward progress toward the light. The illusion of progress falls flat when we realize that it does not get rid of evil. And in fact, it introduces new kinds of evil. Evil still exists, it's as bad as ever, it's not going away. People are just getting better at hiding it. For example, maybe you've heard the reports uh, in Hollywood about these young um, Hollywood movie stars that are being passed around as essentially sex slaves to these higher ups in Hollywood. It, it happens. The pedophile ring in Britain that reached into the highest levels of their government. Slave labor of people, mostly children, in foreign countries so we can have cell phones, watches, clothes, food. We participate in that. The idea and illusion of progress has created and stirs up these problems of evil. And that is why it cannot provide hope and why it has corrupted hope. The second belief that has caused trouble, I said, is called Platonism. And this is a very brief summarization of what Platonism is. But essentially Platonism says that the physical material world, right, me and you, this fleshy stuff, it's an inferior existence. The real world, he says, is purely spiritual. It's above space, time, and matter, and that we need to escape it. We need to escape our physical change, chains. But as we see, that simply is not true. These two beliefs, I think, have wrecked havoc on our society 
and on the Christian worldview of hope and are exactly why Christians are confused about hope. For one, you have these Christians believing that we are in the day and age of the kingdom of God. And we are. But they think that this means that everything is headed towards a better world to get better and better until eventually it's good enough for Jesus to come back. But that's not the case. That's not what the Bible teaches. The illusion of progress has everyone hoping and believing the world's getting better, and it isn't. And when tragedy happens, they can't understand why Christians and non-Christians alike. And they are robbed of hope of a better world because this illusion of progress has lied to them, and they cannot comprehend it. Secondly, Platonism has robbed Christianity of the truth of the resurrection. See, the Platonist idea that the physical, that matter, right, this fleshy stuff, that matter, time, and space are bad, it's seeped into Christianity, and it's all but wiped out the truth that when Jesus returns, and we're going to talk about this more in a second, we will be resurrected from the dead and we'll have a body. And that sounds really, really foreign to us, maybe. But that is what the Scripture teaches. And Matt talked about that in length yesterday, and we're going to briefly go over that. But the Platonist philosophy has Christians believing that when Jesus returns, he's going to rescue us from this physical world, that we'll be lifted up and be floating around or something, whatever it may be, and the earth and the universe are going to be destroyed and be floating in the sky forever. And that as Christians, that is our eternal uh, hope and destination. We're in this, it's this thinly veiled, mysterious, spiritual plane where God exists called heaven, and that's where we're going to go when Jesus comes back. But that's not true. And I think there's this teaching like this. It's why there was such a big pushback from, uh, from conservative Christians in the 70s uh, and even until now of, of the green movement, right? Why try to save the earth when it's just going to get burned up and destroyed anyways? That's simply not going to be the case. And I don't know about you, but having a fully autonomous, fully electron, electric car sounds pretty awesome. I really want a Tesla. I believe that it's precisely and predominantly these two beliefs that have destroyed the hope of Christianity. If that's true, if progress is an illusion, and if our end goal isn't to escape the earth and go to heaven, what's the hope then? What's the hope of Christianity? I'm glad you asked. Thank you for saying that. To understand what the actual Christian hope is, let's recap first what Matt talked about last week. And that's the resurrection. So when we die, specifically when Jesus comes back, we will be given new bodies. That is, when Jesus comes back, we aren't going to be these vague, uh, ambiguous, if you will, non-identifiable spirits floating around. No, instead of being a spirit, we will have and we'll be given a body. The body will be a spiritual body. That means the flesh will be in line with our spirit. See, as it stands now, our for the most part, hopefully, our, our spirit says, I want to do the will of God. But our flesh says, I want to do what pleases me, what feels good. And there's, there's war there. There's tension there. But when we receive our new body, it will be a spiritual body, meaning that the flesh, the tension, will be no more. It will be a spiritual body, but it will be just that, a body. And see, this is critical because it provides hope in two distinct ways. One, because we have bodies, we will still be us. I'm going to be me, sorry, and you're going to be you, right? You're going to have to live with me in heaven. We will have an identity, individuality, and uniqueness still to us. Again, we won't be these floating spirits that have no identity characteristics. We will be recognizable. We will have uh, characteristics of ourselves that set us apart from each other. And the second way it provides hope, it shows us that the internal struggle, this internal battle of good and evil within ourselves will be no more, but that both sides of us, our flesh and our spirit, will both be in line and will want to participate and do good. Paul talks about this in the, the book of Romans, chapter 7. He says, the good, you don't worry about turning there, the good that I want to do, I don't do. The bad that I don't want to do, I do it. And he says, I don't get it. It does not make sense to me. It's this idea of our immediate will versus our general will, Right? My general will says, I want a hot bod for summer. But my immediate will says, I want a dozen donuts. Right? Those two things are are in war with each other. My my general will says, I want to do what God says. But my immediate will says, you know, turn down for what? And for you old people, this is a young I got you, right? The young people. Turn down for what is like partying and you know, not you're not stopping partying and party forever, right? Why would we turn down for what? Boop boop. 
In the, uh, in the resurrection, with our new bodies, this internal struggle between our immediate will and our general will will no longer exist. They will both be in line with each other, and that is the spiritual aspect. And again, it's important that we understand this, that we understand that we will have a body, and that when Jesus comes back uh, at the end of the world, if we want to say it like that, there will be a physical aspect or nature to things. Paul clearly teaches the redemption of our bodies in Romans 8 and 1 Corinthians 15. And if you want to kind of look more at that, I recommend going and watching Matt's sermon from last week. It's on the website. So what is the hope of Christianity then? So part one, the hope of Christianity. We're gonna ha- you're going to have a body, I'm going to have a body that is ours. We will be individuals. We will be able to know and be known by others. Right? You will recognize and will be able to fellowship with other people. Think about that for a second. You'll be able to see, and I believe, talk, eat, fellowship with friends and family members who have died. And not only them, but with anybody and everyone that has a resurrected body. And I do not know about you, but that makes me excited. I am stoked for that, right? Getting to hang out with like Moses and Abraham. You know, like, hey man, who's that guy with this, this sweet beard? That's Abraham? What? No way. Let me go chat with him. Like, that's going to be awesome. That's going to be really, really cool. But what if I told you it gets even better than that? See, I haven't, still told, I haven't told you exactly where we will be, right? We're going to be somewhere because we're going to have a body, but where will that place be? And I think I've made it clear, but if I haven't, let me state it again. In the resurrection, when Jesus returns and brings us back from the dead, we will not exist in the spiritual heavenly place that is devoid of the physical. So where will we exist then? Where will we be? Well, here's part number two of the hope of Christianity. When Jesus returns, he will not only redeem our bodies, but he will redeem the earth and the universe as a whole. He will redeem the creation. So I'm going to take a step back for a second. Why does death have power? Why are we afraid of death? And why is Jesus, all throughout the New Testament, said to have power over death because of his resurrection? What power is it that death holds? Death separates the spirit and the body, right? When we die, our soul uh, is, is, leaves our body. Death has, the power, has power because it upsets God's natural plan, his original plan for humans, which was for us to exist as a combination of this body and the spirit. So Jesus, through his resurrection, has shown that death is no longer to be feared because he's conquered death. He has reunited the body and the the spirit, if you will. He's conquered that separation. And he tells us that if we are in him, then we too will conquer death through him. So Jesus, through his resurrection, has restored slash started to restore the natural order of things. So now that we understand that, let me ask you another question. If we know that God's original intent was for man to be a combo of spirit and body, Where was it that God originally intended for man to exist? Earth. The universe. Inside creation. You see, in the same way that God bought us back from sin, he bought us, he redeemed us from the power of sin and death, and he promised us a new body through the resurrection of Jesus, God will also redeem the earth and the universe, creation as a whole. Romans 8 says, For the creation itself will also be set free from its slavery to corruption and into freedom. In Revelation 21, chapter 21, 22, they are very clear and adamant about an actual new heaven and an actual new earth. And that those, who are, those names who are written in the Lamb's Book of Life, those people who are in Christ, we will exist in that new heaven and the new earth. And this is key. If you're taking notes, write this down. Redemption does not mean scrapping what is there and starting again from a clean slate, but rather liberating what has come to be enslaved. Let me say that again. Redemption does not mean scrapping what is there and starting again from a clean slate, but rather liberating what has come to be enslaved. See, God's not going to simply destroy the creation that he made and declare good as kind of like a, a big cosmic oops. That's not how God operates. See, God is interested in the restoration and the redemption of his original creation, man and universe alike. What God did for Jesus on Easter, he's resurrected him in a new glorified body, 
to him that death has no power, he will do not only for the Christian, but for the creation. He's going to redeem, remake, and restore the creation back to its original intent. An earth, a universe, where mankind exists to rule over the creation as its stewards, and where man exists in fellowship with God. See, life after death does have a physicalness um, to it, a physical aspect to it. It's not going to be like Plato thought, devoid of physicality and existing merely in this spiritual state. Now, it is only through metaphor, imagery, and symbol that we can really imagine what the new heavens, what the new world, the new creation is going to look like. And you may ask, well, how is that really any different then? Well, it's a world of difference. Because sure, we may not know the exact details of the new heavens and the new earth, right? Will I be able to eat chocolate in heaven? Could I pick my nose? Could I do squats with Jesus? I don't know. I, I hope so. Doing squats with Jesus, doing CrossFit with Jesus would be really cool. But I do know that that is what it's going to be in the sense of there will be a new heaven and a new earth. Do I know, am I going to be able to eat chocolate? I'm not sure. But it will be a new heavens and a new earth, a real actual place where I will get to, where we will get to fellowship with God and participate with other people in, in fellowship. God will restore and redeem the earth and the universe, and it's going to be a place for us to enjoy and explore. It will be a place that is physical, a, a place, a place, a universe, and not just the earth, the universe as a whole. We'll be able to travel, discover, learn about it. Think about that. We could travel the universe, right? We are so adamant in our society today about leaving Earth because it's going to die. We're going to run out of resources. Imagine having unlimited amount of time to explore the universe. That's amazing. Planets, solar systems, you can go look at black holes. I have no idea. It's going to be awesome, right? All these different celestial bodies that are out there, we can explore that. See, in addition to being able to discover and learn about the creation, we're going to be able to learn about and interact with other people that are there. Maybe we'll travel the universe with them. I have no idea. Maybe we'll fly. Maybe we'll build spaceships, travel millions of light years. Maybe we'll surf on the back of cosmic whales, eating bacon, listening to heavy metal. I have no idea. But who cares? Because it will be a real place that we'll get to explore and, and enjoy. Time means nothing. And fellowship with other people and with God will be such an incredibly enjoyable experience, we will never get tired of it. We will never get tired of fellowshipping, existing, and enjoying the new heavens and the new creation. And not only will we be able to do that, like I said, we will exist in this relationship with God the way that he originally intended before death and sin entered. We will exist in a relationship where we worship and interact with God as he originally intended. The presence of God will be all in all as it is. N.T. Wright says, One day when all forces of rebellion have been defeated, and the creation responds freely and gladly to the love of its creator, God will fill it with himself, so that it will both remain an independent being, other than God, so God will exist in it, but is independent of it, but the creation will also be flooded with God's own life. The new heavens and the new earth will be flooded with the presence and the goodness of God. Again, I don't know exactly what that looks like, but I want it. I want to be in a place that is flooded with the absolute presence and goodness of God. Now, I'll tell you what, if, if this does not make you excited, I have no idea what will. If I give you 10 bucks, I, I don't have 10 bucks, so sorry, I can't give that to you. But like I said, I am stoked at the possibility. I'm excited, right? Stoked means excited. I'm ex excited, stoked at the possibility of being able to eat steak and do cross it with Abraham and Moses. Or maybe that I'll be able to travel to a planet that's billions of light years away, we'll hang out with Peter and Paul, and when we get there, the planet has trees that grow bacon. I have no idea. Now again, this probably isn't going to be the exact case. I may be stretching it quite a bit, a little bit, right? But the point I'm trying to make is this, that life after death, existing in the new heavens and the new earth with a resurrected body, in the presence of God, it's going to be so much better than anything we can experience or even imagine here on earth. It will be such a blissful, wonderful, great, whatever other adjective you want to put in there, existence, that not only will we never get bored of it, but we will never be able to enjoy it enough. There's always going to be more for us to explore, more for us to enjoy, more for us to be excited about. And see, that 
is what life after death. The hope, the new heavens and the new earth. That is the hope of Christianity. Not this, this vague spiritual playing where we play harps for Jesus and feed him grapes or something like that. It is going to be a place where we exist and enjoy and experience, learn, grow so much more than we can ever fathom here on earth. See, this belief in a tangible new heavens and new earth should provide us with such a real hope that, like I said earlier, our actions and our behavior better conform to that of Jesus. See, this hope isn't just, okay, great, I, I, I'm a Christian, and I got the hope coming, let me just kind of sit and wait. No, this hope should inspire us to change and modify our behavior. That way, not only will we be able to participate in the new heavens and earth, but by our actions, we will be able to anticipate the new heavens and the new earth. Right Through our actions, we can go, I'm going to participate, and that makes me happy. And by my actions, I am anticipating. I'm saying, the good that I do is a, a brief kind of, of glimpse. It is a shimmer of the goodness that will exist in the new heavens and the new earth. And not only that, but I believe that this preaching of, of hope, right, of the new heavens and the new earth, and not just by me, but by you as well, that when we preach, when we have, we preach something that's more focused on the future hope and awesomeness of the new heavens and the new earth, rather than so much focus, not that we ignore it completely on eternal judgment, right? We still have to talk about hell. We can't ignore it. But when we focus more on the future hope and awesomeness of the new heavens and the new earth, it will be a critical aspect in expanding the kingdom of God on earth. And uh, bam, sorry, I didn't give you a cue if you guys want to go ahead and pop up now. But when we preach and we focus more on the hope of Christianity, I believe that people are going to be more willing to listen to what we have to say rather than, yeah, you need to be a Christian so you don't die and burn in hell. That's so negative. Christianity and the New Testament teaches a positive hope, and that's what they preach. Why should I be a Christian, right? Well, imagine instead of saying, so you don't burn in hell, it's so you can say, because of Jesus, you will be able to exist in a world, a real place, that is so much better than even the best thing on earth. And then you get to go on and explain the hope of the resurrection and the new heavens and the new earth. The hope of Christianity is real and tangible. It's not some veiled, mysterious thing. I hope that I've um, instilled some hope in you. I want to ask the question now, how do we participate in this hope? Kind of as Mr. Joe was talking about uh, in his communion meditation. Romans 8 talks about the redemption of our body and of the earth. It says that uh, those who will have a new body, that those who will be redeemed at the coming of Jesus are in Christ Jesus Romans 8.1 says, therefore, there's now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Well, as Mr. Joe was saying, how do we get in Christ Jesus, if you will? Galatians 3 says, for you're all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. Those of you who've been baptized into Christ, you've clothed yourself with Christ and you belong to Christ. If you want to know how to participate in this awesome hope, if you want to know what it means to be in Christ, to be a Christian, to look forward and have this hope that when you die, there will be a real, tangible, awesome existence, I encourage you, please come talk to me afterwards. I'm going to pray here in a second. Band's going to play a song. Come talk to me. Talk to one of the elders, uh, Rick, uh, Uncle Clyde, someone about hope. Let's pray. God, thank you for your son. Thank you for Jesus that he provided hope for us that he was the first fruits through his resurrection, Lord, that we can look forward uh, to spending eternal life with you in the new heavens and the new earth and enjoying it. It's the name of your son that I pray. Amen.